talking about cardiovascular disorders and due to time constraints, it's going to be the down and dirty cardiovascular disorders. So we're going to hit the highlights, but I promise I'm not going to leave any critical information out. So I'm going to hustle, but if you do have questions, please feel free to stop me and ask questions. I will entertain questions today. All right, we're going to start off with good old hypertension. Y'all are familiar with hypertension? You pick up patients all the time with hypertension. Um, an interesting point was made the other day in class. When you pick up a patient that has a blood pressure of 170 over 100, usually as a paramedic, you're okay with that. We can transport that patient. We can get them to the hospital. But in the hospital setting, we would like our patient's systolic blood pressure to be less than 140, no higher than 160. <laughs> We want their diastolic pressure to be less than 90, and we want it to stay there. We don't want to see blood pressures that are 170 over 100. There are two different classifications of blood pressure. There is primary, otherwise known as essential hypertension, and this is basically hypertension that there is not a cause for. There's nothing we can say this is the reason they have hypertension. 90% of folks that have hypertension have primary or what Hypertension. Secondary hypertension has a specific cause. We know why it exists, and it might be related to family history, the age, gender, ethnic background, stress, so we know what the actual cause can be. We do see blood pressure running run in families, obviously, and as we get older in age, our risk for hypertension is also going to increase. Males will start out having a higher risk, but as females get older, the risk actually is the same as a male. When we're looking at ethnic backgrounds, we have harder times controlling patients with Afri or African American patients. We have harder time controlling their blood pressure and keeping it regulated just due to their ethnic background. They have um, a renin angiotensin system that's a little bit harder to control, therefore they have more hypertension type issues. The signs and symptoms of hypertension. Hypertension is going to be asymptomatic, meaning in the early stages the patient may have hypertension but they feel great. They don't realize anything's going on. It's later if it's untreated we get into things like headache, fatigue, dizziness, palpitations, vision changes, or epistasis otherwise known as nosebleeds. With uncontrolled hypertension, especially if it's prolonged over a long period of time, it leads to organ diseases such as heart, brain, kidney, or eye issues. Okay? So it actually can do some critical or organ damage long term if untreated. If you ever get to go to a dialysis unit, um, ask what some of the patients are there for. You'd be surprised because most patients are either there due to diabetes type problems or hypertension issues where they've damaged their kidneys. Got a shiver hint for you. Keep in mind that one elevated blood pressure reading does not mean you have hypertension. This morning before your HESI test, we probably could have checked your blood pressure and it probably was a little elevated, but does that mean you have hypertension? Well, no, that was more of a situational hypertension. What we need is a consistently high blood pressure reading. Also, the patient is <coughs> stress-free in a relaxed environment when we see this elevated reading. There's also something called the white coat phenomenon. Just the whole fact that a patient is going to the doctor sometimes will elevate their blood pressure. So when they get to the doctor's office, they always have an elevated blood pressure when in fact it's the fact that they are at the physician, and if you remove them from that situation, they wouldn't have hypertension. So that's something else we need to consider. Some physicians will actually have patients just stop by the office at random, not to see the doctor, but just drop in, have your blood pressure checked, and a lot of times we'll see their blood pressure is actually a lot lower when that white coat phenomenon does not occur. To manage hypertension, obviously some lifestyle modification, diet and exercise, um, is always good. Weight reduction, restrict alcohol, caffeine, and salt intake. 
Um, anybody that has issues with hypertension, one of the first things they could actually do is restrict some of their salt intake to see if that doesn't help. Because you all know <laughs> where there's salt, there's going to be water. There's also a diet called the DASH diet, and this stands for Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. But again, they focus on um, how much fluid you're taking in, how much sodium you're taking in, also weight reduction, exercise, and things along that line. So when you hear the DASH diet, this is one that is customized for the treatment of hypertension. So we can change the way we eat, we can change our exer or increase our exercise, we can limit our salt intake, but then sometimes we have to turn to medications. And there are a bunch of medications that we can utilize for hypertension. The first line treatment for most cases of mild hypertension, if you go to the doctor today and your doctor says, well, you do have hypertension, he's probably going to put you on a thiazide diuretic. This is also known as, or you'll see it abbreviated as HCTZ, and that stands for hydrochlorothiazide, or HCTZ. Uh, this will cause, of course, an increase in the urine output, so it does deplete some of your volume, but it also will lower the blood pressure. It is given by mouth. Thiazide diuretics will also deplete your sodium level. Okay, so it can lower your sodium level as well. Other side effects, it can lower your potassium level. Not as much as a loop diuretic will that we'll talk about in a minute, but it does have the potential to alter your electrolytes. So we do have to monitor potassium and sodium levels and also make sure the patient is not getting dehydrated. The second type of diuretic that the physician may order is called a loop diuretic. And you're familiar with Lasix because I think most of y'all carry those on the ambulance. Um, Lasix, Bumex, and Demodex all fall into the loop diuretic group. And if you look, they're all very similar in their spelling. Okay, they all end in the IX or the EX. The action is to excrete water and sodium and potassium. We definitely lose a lot of potassium with Lasix. So in the hospital setting, if we're given Lasix, we have to supplement the patient's potassium level as well. Those go hand in hand. Lasix will promote vasodilation as well, so it's going to open up those vessels. So it does lower blood pressure. We can use it for the treatment of hypertension, decreasing edema in patients that have congestive heart failure or volume overload. The routes, if given IV push, has to be a slow IV push. And the reason for that is if you push Lasix too fast, it actually can cause temporary deafness in your patient. Um, we do have Lasix or Demodex drips, so we might actually hook a piggyback or we might give a um, continuous infusion to a patient of a Demodex drip. And Lasix also comes in pill form, so the patient could take that as home as well. The major side effects are going to be related to that decreased potassium level. So anytime you administer Lasix in the hospital setting, you need to know what your patient's last potassium level was. Also a good thing to know would be, well, what was their last blood pressure reading? Because if their blood pressure is 70 over 30, it doesn't make sense to go administer Lasix. We must replace that potassium that's lost and check that blood pressure prior to administration. A third type of diuretic that may be used for the treatment of hypertension is called the potassium sparing diuretics. And these do just what they sound like they do. They actually retain potassium. So we do lose volume, but we don't lose the potassium. And you might actually see a thiazide diuretic a patient may be on a loop diuretic and also on a potassium sparing diuretic. They all work in different ways, depending on what's wrong with the patient. But we need to know, based on the drugs that the patient's being given, what we need to monitor for. Uh, the aldactone is used for edema, could be used for the essential or that primary hypertension. And sometimes we may use it if the patient has some hypokalemia and they need to be diuresed. That might be the drug of choice. And it comes in the PO form or oral form as well. All right, 
So that's an overall summary of the different diuretics that the doctor may order. We need to talk about some of the other drugs or the antihypertensive agents that we traditionally think of being treatments for hypertension. First one are beta blockers. And if you'll note by the spelling there, um, the names, most beta blockers are going to end in LOL, or what I call the LOL drugs. Okay? So if you're ever stuck on a drug name and you're not sure what classification that drug might be, if you pick up on that the drug ends in LOL, that might be a big clue that, hey, this is a beta blocker. Beta blockers will decrease the heart's need for blood and oxygen by decreasing the workload. They're very, very beneficial in patients that are having angina or prevention of MIs. We can use them for tachyarrhythmias because beta blockers are going to slow down the patient's heart rate. So if a patient has an accelerated heart rate, heart rate, we may administer beta blockers to the patient. We also can use beta blockers for the treatment of migraine headaches, tremors, CHF, and please note at the very bottom I have for the treatment of hypertension. Just keep in mind that beta blockers aren't just used for they have many, many, many other purposes. Um, and most CHF patients are going to be on a beta blocker because look what it does. It decreases the heart's need uh, for blood in O2. It also will increase the ejection fraction. And just to remind you what the ejection fraction is, that's the amount of blood that's pumped out of the left ventricle when it contracts. So essentially it increases your cardiac output. Side effects of beta blockers, of course, if we're giving it, we could actually lower the patient's blood pressure, so we need to monitor for hypotension. It is going to lower the heart rate. So generally, if a patient has a heart rate less than 50, we would hold the beta blocker. We don't want their heart rate to get any lower than that. It also can affect blood glucose levels, depending on which type of beta blocker it is. And it takes a couple weeks, maybe even a month or so, before the patient will see the full effects of a beta blocker. It takes them also a little time to get used to it, because initially it's going to wear them out. They're going to feel bad when they start a beta blocker. And it may take a couple weeks to a month before they start to feel better. A second group of antihypertensives are the ACE inhibitors. And that stands for angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor. I refer to these as the prills because if you look at the names of the drugs provided there, a lot of those end with pril. So if you're ever looking through your patient's med list and you see a pril, if you'll learn that those are ACE inhibitors, that might help uh, clue you into what drugs the patient's taking. The action of prills is to decrease your vascular resistance. So essentially it's going to open up all your vessels, therefore it's going to lower your blood pressure. It is a pretty potent vasodilator. We see ACE inhibitors used for the treatment of CHF. Just think about it. If we open up all the vessels, relax the vessels, well, then the heart doesn't have to fight as hard to push blood through the circulation. So it's a great drug for CHF patients. It also helps protect the kidneys and can be used for the treatment of hypertension as well. So again, another drug that has other things that it does but it is used as an antihypertensive agent also. Side effects, a dry, hacky cough, and that's one of the most common complaints with ACE inhibitors is a dry, hacky cough. Once you take the ACE inhibitor away, or the patient comes off the ACE inhibitor, then the cough usually resolves itself. Low blood pressure also could be a side effect, and for the guys, erectile dysfunction is a common reason that Male patients don't in particular like ACE inhibitor drugs because it causes erectile dysfunction and they don't like that. They'd rather have hypertension than have some erectile dysfunction. So, uh, but we can use other drugs if that's the case. And I've got a little hint there on the screen for you. ACE inhibitors are not as effective with African American populations. And again, that goes back to their renin angiotensin system. Third class of antihypertensives I want to mention are the calcium channel blockers, or what I call the PEEN drugs. Not, not all calcium channel blockers are going to end in P-I-N-E. Also, not all drugs that end in P-I-N-E are calcium channel blockers. For example, atropine. 
Atropine is not a calcium channel blocker. But you may pick up on you know, the spelling and say, hmm, I wonder if this is a calcium channel blocker. They will lower your blood pressure. They also decrease the electrical conduction through the SA and the AV node and cause vascular relaxation. So essentially they are going to lower the blood pressure. But we will also use calcium channel blockers for the treatment of angina or the atrial dysrhythmias, whether it be AFib or A-flutter. We can use it for PVD, and that's actually one of the most common drugs we use for folks that have vascular or peripheral vascular disease, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. But if calcium channel blockers are going to cause all the vessels to relax, well, that will facilitate circulation for those patients with peripheral vascular disease. And then lastly, we also can use calcium channel blockers for <laughs> hypertension. Again, side effects we need to consider, lower blood pressure, headache, and edema. The fourth class of our antihypertensive agents are the ARBs, or the angiotensin receptor blockers. If you look at the spelling of those, those two have a distinct ending when you're looking at the drug name specifically. These are very similar to ACE inhibitors. They increase your cardiac output, and they are very effective with CHF patients as well. Um, it also, these have also been shown to slow down the progression of kidney disease. So if we have a patient that has some kidney problems anyway, maybe due to diabetes or uncontrolled hypertension, this might be a good drug for them. Treatment, hypertension and CHF generally are the two reasons we would use ARBs. And again, the side effects shouldn't be that surprising. If we're going to give something that lowers blood pressure, well then a side effect could be low blood pressure. Just wanted you to be aware of some combination drugs that are out there. Pharmacology is getting really interesting because we're starting to stick drugs together and put two drugs into one pill. And I just want you to look at some of these and see, can you identify what they are? Like the Zyac 10 6.25, the wall drug plus HCTZ. So what we have is a beta blocker plus a thiazide diuretic. And this will come with practice but you're going to see more and more medications that are actually two different drugs put together in one pill. Okay. Next, I want to talk a little bit about a hypertensive crisis. This is an emergency situation where the patient is in danger of having organ damage due to elevated blood pressure. Usually, we're going to see an elevated pressure, we're looking at the diastolic now, the bottom number of over 130. That's pretty scary. I hope that gets you all excited as paramedics, like, ooh, this, this isn't good. What we're concerned with is the rate of the increase. That's actually more important than the absolute value. How fast did that go up? Generally, the emergency room doctors will want to get that blood pressure down. They'll give it about an hour time frame or so. That would be the goal, to get the pressure down. But we really want to prevent organ damage, and we're talking about kidneys and um, the hearts and any of the vital organs that could be damaged due to prolonged, the brain, due to prolonged elevation of blood pressure. This occurs when folks basically haven't complied with their medications or they haven't been on the correct medication regimen. All right, does anybody have any questions about hypertension? All right. Move on to heart failure. With heart failure, you may hear it called just good old heart failure or congestive heart failure, either one. But essentially what occurs is the myocardium cannot maintain the cardiac output. The heart muscle basically is worn out and it just can't maintain the cardiac output to meet the needs of the body. It could be related to systolic or what we consider the contraction phase, or the diastolic or the filling phase. It could be a contraction dysfunction or a filling dysfunction. Okay? If you think about it, when the heart contracts, that's when the heart is in systole, and when the heart is relaxing and filling, that's when we consider it the diastolic phase. So that's what that's referring to. Common reasons for heart failure, you can read all those that are listed there, but some of the more common ones I actually have starred. The coronary artery disease, or CAD, 
This is due to plaque or hardening of the arteries. Um, and over time, it can lead to congestive heart failure. Those vessels don't stretch anymore. Hypertension is also a prominent cause of congestive heart failure. We also could have metabolic disorders or valve disorders secondary to rheumatic fever. Um, and rheumatic fever usually is related to previous strep infections that have been untreated. Rheumatic fever will cause vegetation or little growths to occur on the valves of the vessel and can cause some cardiac abnormalities or cardiac failure. Cardiomyopathy is a broad term that we use for just any heart muscle disorder. So you might hear the doctor say, oh, well, the patient has cardiomyopathy. Well, that means they could have 20 different things. It means something's wrong with the heart muscle in general. And heart failure commonly follows myocardial infarction or an MI. If the patient has an MI, loses part of their muscle wall. Well, then that muscle wall is not going to function or contract like it used to. So it would make sense that they would have some heart failure as a result of losing part of the heart tissue. Signs and symptoms of CHF. Pump failure will result in a decreased perfusion of tissue, so the output, the cardiac output, is going to be less. But then you also have to consider the backup. And I always like to compare this to a traffic jam in a big city. Y'all probably been to a big city and you were trying to move on through quickly and there was a wreck in front of you. So nobody was getting through. There was no output, if you want to think of it that way. But then think about you and all the people that were backed up still trying to get into the city. Well, that would be all the congestion that's backed up out throughout the body when you have heart failure. So when you think of CHF, you can compare it to like a wreck in Atlanta or something of that nature. Other signs and symptoms, volume overload. They are unable to manage the volume that they have. They also have decreased tissue perfusion because we don't have that output coming out of the heart. And activity intolerance will also be an issue. They're going to get short of breath really easily. I want to specifically talk about left-sided heart failure just briefly. With left-sided heart failure, your left ventricle cardiac output is decreased. And if you think about it, where does your left ventricle, when it contracts, where does it push blood to? The rest of your body. The rest of your body. The rest of your body. So would it make sense if my cardiac output to the rest of my body is decreased that I would have renal failure? If you're not getting blood to your kidneys, well, how are they going to work? The kidneys might actually be fine, but the problem is you're not perfusing the kidneys with blood. You also might have cerebral hypoxia. Or we might be not getting oxygen to the brain, so we might see altered mental status with these patients just because we don't have enough cardiac output. But then consider what happens with this blood that's accumulating on the left side of the heart and behind it or in the pulmonary circulation. You're going to see a lot of respiratory type issues with left-sided heart failure. So when you think left-sided heart failure, I want you to think lung type symptoms. And this might be dyspnea, cough, orthopnea. Orthopnea is a term that we use for somebody who breathes better when they're sitting up or they're standing or they're in an upright position. They're unable to lay flat and breathe effectively. Okay, so it's a very positional. Chain Stokes respirations may also occur. And these are very irregular respirations with periods of apnea. Pulmonary edema may also occur. The bottom line with left-sided heart failure is it's primarily going to be evidenced by changes in the lungs. You need to think left, think lungs. Okay. We may also notice extra heart sounds when somebody has CHF. So you may pick up a good S3 heart sound. Traditionally, we would hear the S1, S2. But with CHF patients, it's not uncommon to hear an S3 or possibly an S4 heart sound. With right-sided right heart failure, we have to think about it a little bit differently. The right ventricle cardiac output is decreased. Okay, So when you have right-sided heart failure, what I want you to think of is everything gets round. And what I'm mainly talking about is the uh, abdominal area. They're going to have a lot of hepatomegaly or liver enlargement. They could have abdominal pain, anorexia, nausea, bloating 
dependent edema, and this might be in the lower extremities, okay? For patients that have been bedridden or even males, they could develop dependent edema in their scrotal sac, okay? So any body area that is dependent that we could push fluid, you will develop dependent edema. There's also a term up here, anasarca. Y'all heard of anasarca before? It always reminds me of a worm. I think of a worm or something. But anasarca is the medical term we use for generalized edema. That means they're just kind of swollen everywhere. Okay? Don't get that confused with ascites. Ascites is the term we use when it's in the belly. They have fluid accumulation in the belly. Renal failure may also be a sign or symptom of right-sided heart failure due to volume overload. And jugular vein distension may also be noted. So when you think right-sided heart failure, I want to think everything's getting round because it's swollen. So you're more likely to see edema-type uh, signs and symptoms with right-sided heart failure. Okay? So left is lungs, right is round. What are we going to do to test these patients? Obviously, they'll have chest x-rays. Um, and what the doctor's going to be looking at is the size of the heart, because probably what we're going to see is a big old enlarged heart. Think about what happens when you work out. Your muscles get bigger, don't they? Don't they? Yeah. Okay. So if I have a heart muscle that's continuously struggling to pump and having to work harder and work harder and work harder, what's going to happen to that heart muscle? It actually is going to get bigger as well, and that's not a good thing. The doctor may order echocardiograms, or what we refer to as an echo. This is an ultrasound that evaluates the heart muscle and also the valve functioning. So it, just, it watches while the heart contracts to see if we have effective contraction. We also can estimate somebody's ejection fraction using an echocardiogram. Frequently, we'll do echoes if a patient has chest pain or maybe they've had an MI. Uh, if we know EKG changes or we suspect cardiomyopathy or some kind of muscle issue with the heart. And then, of course, to evaluate the valve function as well, make sure the valves are closing like they should, make sure we don't have any regurgitation. We can see all that with an echocardiogram. Other testing that may incur, BNP stands for B-type natriuretic peptide, and this is getting to be a more common lab test. I say that, but then I'm also going to tell you you're going to see it go away as well because a lot of insurance is not paying for BNPs. What a BNP is is a serum marker, so it's a blood test we can draw on somebody that has CHF, and essentially what it tells us is how bad is the patient's CHF, okay? The normal range should be less than 100, and you don't have to learn that right now, but just to give you an idea, we'll have patients that have a BNP of 700. As we give them Lasix and treat them for their CHF, we'll see their BNP drop to 400. That means we're, whatever we're doing is working, okay? As opposed to a patient with a BNP of 700, we treat them, so we think, and then we check them again and their next BNP is 1,200, okay? Again, the normal should be less than 100. I've seen them as high as 4,800. It just kind of tells you how bad is this CHF. And where this uh, BNP comes from is as the vessels are stretched in the body, it releases this peptide, and that's what we're monitoring. It's due to excessive stretching of the vessels. We can also do EKGs on the patient with CHF to look for rhythm changes, uh, bundle branch blocks, things of that nature. ABGs may be done to evaluate their oxygen and carbon dioxide status. You all know all about that now. BUN and creatinine would be evaluated because both with left and right-sided heart failure, you could have complications with the kidneys. Um, and your BUN and creatinine are two quick markers that we can use to get a quick glance at, hey, what's going on with the kidney function? LFT stands for liver function tests, especially if the patient has right-sided heart failure and they've got a lot of fluid here and a large liver then we may need to monitor their liver status as well. With a heart failure diet, this is going to vary depending on the patient and, again, how bad is that CHF. The doctor is going to order for sodium restriction, and it's going to vary. You might see anything from a 250 milligram to a 2-gram sodium 
restriction per day. It's going to depend on the patient's needs and you know what the doctor wants for that patient. He may also specify fluid restriction. The doctor may limit a patient on the extreme measures, may limit them to maybe 600 milliliters per day. If I just had my guesses, I would think y'all probably have already had more than 600 milliliters to day in fluid intake. So, and when the doctor orders that, he wants us to measure every little milliliter that the patient has intake. Okay, we count everything. So it's a pretty strict regimen. The doctor may also order a low calorie diet. Uh, we want the body weight to be ideal or slightly lower. Um, having a patient that is obese with CHF, you can just imagine how much harder the heart has to work. We also will need to monitor for hypokalemia and hyperkalemia because we're probably going to be using um, diuretics, probably going to be using supplements, potassium supplements. So we're going to have to make sure we have a balance there with our medication and our diet so our patient's potassium levels are out of whack. Avoiding cardiac stimulants. Stimulants would be things like caffeine in the diet, um, nicotine, things of that nature. I call them all the fun things. But you take all the cardiac stimulants away from the patients as well. And then they need to eat small, frequent meals because we don't want any gastric distension that actually could apply pressure on the heart. All right, so let's talk a little bit about CHF medications. We've talked about most of these already. We've mentioned diuretics, talk about the loops, the thiazides, and the potassium sparing. I've mentioned beta blockers or the law drugs, the ACE inhibitors or the um, prills. Um, we can also use ionotropes and vasodilators. I'm going to talk a little bit about the most common inotrope, which is digoxin. Y'all heard of digoxin? Digoxin is just one of those drugs that is very common. And probably if you have any standardized test ever, digoxin is going to be on that test. I'm about guarantee it will be on your boards. It's just that common of a drug. This drug is used to um, increase cardiac output. It increases ventricular contraction, but it decreases the actual workload of the heart. So I like to think of DIG as making the heart work smarter, not harder. So when the heart does contract, it's going to contract a little more effectively, and we're going to increase the cardiac output. One of the things that does happen with lenoxin or digoxin, it will decrease the patient's heart rate. That's a guarantee. We use digoxin <coughs> primarily for CHF or atrial fib or atrial flutter. So you can about make a bet that if your patient's on DIG, they have CHF and or an atrial dysrhythmia. Those are about the only two things we use digoxin for. With the dosing, if you're giving IV push digoxin, it has to be pushed very slow. And I'm talking about over five minutes slow. It will be diluted to normal saline. Digoxin also comes in a pill form that the patient can take at home as well. We do monitor serum levels on patients. And the therapeutic range would be 0.5 to 2 when you're looking at a digoxin serum level. If a patient comes into the emergency room with a heart rate of 30 and the patient's on digoxin, one of the first things the doctor's going to do is check a DIG level or digoxin level to see, well, maybe they took too, many, too much of their medication. Um, Y'all have probably heard patients say, well, if one pill makes you feel good, well, two will make you feel great. So they double up on medication, and sometimes that can get them into trouble. Side effects, one of the biggest side effects is a decreased heart rate, but there we do need to monitor for signs of toxicity, and those include halos. Y'all probably as a kid went swimming and would leave your eyes open underwater when you're swimming in a chlorine pool. Y'all ever do that? And then the rest of the day, it seemed like every, every light had a halo around it. Well, patients that have DIG toxicity will experience similar type halos or complain of yellow vision. Everything has a yellow hue to it. They may also show signs of altered mental status or nausea and vomiting. When they get to the nausea and vomiting part, that's when their body is saying, hey, we got to get this out of here. It's trying to compensate for that toxicity. Okay. 
Some things we need to know as the nurse. For DIG to work effectively, the patient needs to have a normal potassium level and a normal mag level. If the mag or potassium is out of whack or abnormal, then the DIG will not be effective. Okay. DIG also requires a very detailed nursing assessment. This is something we have to do. We have to, as the nurse, listen to the patient's apical pulse for one minute prior to administering digoxin. That's nursing wall. Apical pulse for one minute prior to administering digoxin. If the heart rate is 60 or higher, we can give the digoxin. If it's 59 or lower, we have to hold it. We may hold it for a couple hours and then the heart rate comes up and then we could give it later. But at that point in time, you will hold digoxin if heart rate is 59 or less. Okay. If we have a patient that is dig toxic or we know they have taken too much dig, there is an antidote and it's called digibind. Well, that makes sense. It's going to bind to the digoxin and help it uh, be excreted. The patient needs to be instructed to take the medication as directed, and possibly they may be instructed how to count their own pulse. Will they be doing apical pulses? Not necessarily, but just imagine trying to teach an 86-year-old grandmother how to take her own pulse. That may not be realistic for the patient. <laughs> Though if it is, you can kind of do that, but we also don't want to increase their worry um, when we don't have to. We need to teach them about signs and symptoms of dish toxicity, the nausea, vomiting, the yellow vision, the halos. We also need to tell them don't use over-the-counter herbal medications. And the big one that comes to mind is St. John's wort. There's a lot of stuff, a lot of medications that are not compatible with St. John's wort. So if you're ever taking a test and it says, what would you not give with any medication, probably a pretty good choice or a pretty good guess would be St. John's work because it's not compatible with a lot of stuff. Okay. Uh, we also don't want to take in acids or antidiarrheals within two hours of the digoxin as well because it can affect the absorption. The biggest thing with dig though, you got to monitor that heart rate, assess that apical pulse for 60 seconds prior to administration. Other inotropes I want to mention real quickly, dobutamine might be one you've heard of, or dobutrex. Another common one is milarone or primacor. With these, these are rescue drugs. These are CHF exacerbation rescue drugs. They do increase cardiac output. When the patient's in a severe CHF exacerbation, they've got fluid everywhere, they've got long effects, what the doctor will do is usually admit them for a couple days, and they'll put him on a dobutamine drip. These drips only come, well, they're only in IV form, but the doctor will order them. Uh, he may order five micrograms per kilogram per minute. So the doctor will write, I need five micrograms per kilogram per minute of dobutamine. As the nurse, we have to calculate, well, how many milliliters per hour is that going to be based on their weight, the daily weight with these patients? The thing about dobutamine and the other inotropes is you can only use it for short-term management. So these are only rescue drugs we can use for 48 hours, and then they're not as effective for the patient. So it will pull the patient out of CHF exacerbation, but it's not, they're not designed for long-term use. Side effects include hypertension. We might see an increased heart rate. And also, PVCs may occur with these medications. Something else to note about these drugs is if we're diuresing these patients or giving them diuretics, their daily weight is going to change each day. We hope. We hope it's dropping if they have you know, volume overload. So it's going to be real important that based on their daily weight that we adjust this drip to match whatever their daily weight is. So if you have a patient on one of these drugs, we as the nurse, usually it's the daytime nurse will handle this, they have to figure out what the daily weight is in kilograms and then reset 
the pump to deliver the correct amount of medication. All right, any questions about congestive heart failure? All right, we're going to move into some of the circulatory disorders. I've got a couple definitions here. Just want to go over real quick. Y'all have heard of most of these, I would imagine. A thrombus is a blood clot that is stuck in a vessel wall. Thrombophlebitis is when there's a blood clot plus inflammation of a vessel. Embolism is an occlusion of a vessel by a foreign object, and that could be several things. That could be a clot, it could be air, or it could be fat even. You could have fat embolisms. An embolus is a foreign object moving in circulation. And then I just wanted to add peripheral vascular disease. Peripheral vascular disease is a very broad term that includes any condition that causes partial or complete obstruction of the arteries or veins outside the chest. So any basically circulation disorder outside of the chest is considered peripheral vascular disease. So that includes a bunch of different disorders. And we're going to talk about several of those here in just a minute, starting with the venous problems. Deep vein thrombosis, or DVT, this is where we have thrombophlebitis, or we have a clot plus inflammation of the deep veins. We see it more commonly with females. And the risk is venous stasis, or immobility, puts people at high risk for deep vein thrombosis. Um, long airplane rides, or patients that are bedridden, when we're not moving our legs, or we don't have that calf muscle pump that actually can increase your risk for DVTs. If patients have increased clotting, maybe they are uh, they clot faster than other people, that puts them at risk for DVTs. Or if there's an injury to the venous wall. Causes may be due to immobilization, or again, absence of that calf pump. If they're not moving or walking, that would put them at risk for DVTs as well. What we're gonna look for as nurses is that unilateral calf pain. It would be rare that you have bilateral DVTs. Although it can occur, usually it's just on one side or the other, and the patient's going to complain of severe pain. That calf's going to be red. If you check a Holman sign on the patient, it's going to be positive, and you may see some swelling as well. What you don't want to do is massage that calf because we don't want that clot or that thrombus taking off uh, and turning into an embolism. <coughs> The treatment of DVT includes bed rest, and that's probably the best thing we can do for the patient is put them on bed rest, elevate their legs. Of course, we will give them pain medications to manage their pain. Anticoagulants will probably be ordered, and this may include heparin or coumadin, both of which we'll talk about more detail in just a second. Um, fibrolytic agents on occasion have been used, and y'all are probably more familiar with those as clot busters or medications that we would give to dissolve a clot with a MI, uh, Redivase, the TNK ACE, the drugs like that that we would use for um, clots when a heart attack is present. That's what I'm referring to there with the fibrolytic agents. Those actually dissolve clots. What you need to keep in mind is heparin and Coumadin do not dissolve clots. They prevent more future clots from forming. Okay. And then yesterday, I think we mentioned a little bit with the respiratory lectures, patients may end up with a vena cava filter. Um, and this would be a filter, the picture's there on the right, this little filter we insert in the body that will actually trap clots and hold them till the body can dissolve them on their own or the body can reabsorb them. Uh, this is also sometimes referred to as a green field filter. But essentially what it does is it just sits there, especially if somebody's at high risk or prone to clotting, they may end up with a green field filter or a vena cava filter. All right, let's talk a little bit about heparin. Heparin is a drug we commonly use in the hospital setting. It is good because it prevents new clots from forming, but it also prevents extension of existing clots. So you might have a patient on heparin because they have a clot, well, we want to prevent new clots from forming, but we don't want the clot that's there to also get larger. And patients commonly are on heparin when they have an MI 
or they have a pulmonary embolism or DVT. <coughs> Routes for heparin can be IV or sub-Q. And when a patient is on heparin, there is a lab test that has to be monitored, and it's called your PTT or your partial thromboplastin time. And this is a hard concept to grasp. Sometimes I'm going to try to make it as easy as possible. Anytime your patient is on heparin, the doctor's probably going to monitor PTTs on a frequent basis. It might be daily. It might be a little more frequent than that. But if you use your imagination, take the two T's there in the PTT and just imagine that being a capital H. And that will remind you that a PTT evaluates heparin. Because when we talk about some of the other tests, it might get confusing in a minute. So when you think of PTT, imagine the two T's being an H. PTT evaluates heparin. When a patient is not on heparin, they have no heparin in their body, if you took our PTT levels right now, the range would probably be anywhere from 25 to 37 seconds. And all this is, is how long does it take your body to make a clot? Okay? So when you're not on heparin, it should take 25 to 37 seconds. But somebody that is on heparin, we want them to take longer to clot. So for them to be therapeutic on heparin, their PTT would have to be one and a half to two times the normal range or the I'm not on heparin range. So the therapeutic range for somebody on heparin is 37.5 to 74 seconds. And again, that may vary a little bit depending on the institution or where you are. But that's the general concept is know what your normal range is. And then your therapeutic range is going to be one and a half to two times the normal range. Okay. The antidote, if the patient has a heparin overdose, and that does happen sometimes, maybe their blood gets way too thin. Maybe we check a PTT level, and we see a PTT level that comes back greater than 100. What is that telling us? It's taking way too long for their blood to clot. They're at risk for bleeding. So in that case, we may actually have to give the patient something called protamine sulfate. And a little interesting tidbit about protamine sulfate, if y'all are ever on Jeopardy or what have you, protamine sulfate actually is fish sperm. Now, how we discovered that fish sperm would actually reverse heparin, I don't, I don't even want to know how we figured that out. But protamine sulfate is fish sperm. That has been a mistake. <laughs> what y'all think about that? Is it any particular type of fish or just it's, fish in general? It's salmon sperm. That's nasty. That is nasty. And that's about the extent of my knowledge on that. I don't want to know how we discovered that. But you'll never forget protamine sulfate either. Other information about heparin, uh, it does have a very short half-life. So it is gone out of the body relatively quickly. Patients having major... Um, open heart surgery may be on heparin up until the morning of their surgery because it only takes 90 minutes or so for the heparin to be out of the body. Okay, so that's not uncommon that patients will be on heparin right up till the time they go to surgery. You would think they would be worried about bleeding to death, but because of the short half life, that heparin will be gone. Something else to note, uh, there are many, many different strengths of heparin, and this was brought to media attention with uh, Dennis Quaid and his twins several, I guess it's been several years ago, where they got the wrong dose of heparin. Heparin comes in 10 units per milliliter, 100 units per milliliter, 1,000 units per milliliter, 10,000 units per milliliter vials, and it's easily, easily can be mistaken for the wrong dose of heparin. Uh, with Dennis Quaid's children, they were given an overdose of heparin. Another drug you need to be very familiar with is Coumadin. Y'all probably have heard about Coumadin. This one we use to prevent new clots from forming. Okay, so it doesn't do anything with a clot that's already there. It prevents the formation of new clots. The only route, well, the most common route you give Coumadin would be PO. In some rare cases, you may see Coumadin given IV, but traditionally we're going to consider Coumadin a PO medication. With Coumadin, you have to monitor the patient's PT and INR levels. Okay, the PT stands for prothrombin time. 
that INR stands for International Normalized Ratio. The PT and INR are very similar to what the PTT does with heparin, okay, except the PTT only monitors heparin. The PT only monitors Coumadin, all right? The normal PT is 11 to 15 seconds, and this means I am not on Coumadin. So most of us are not on Coumadin. If you check our PT levels, it should come back 11 to 15 seconds. But we want our patient to take a little bit longer to clot. So what we do is put them on the Coumadin, and then we'll check their PTT levels, and we want their therapeutic range, or what we consider the therapeutic range, it would be one and a half to two times the normal, or the I'm not on Coumadin level. So we would see that higher, it'd be more like 16 and a half to 37 and a half. And again, depending on the institution where you are, that may vary um, a little bit. But know what your normal is and know to be therapeutic, it's going to have to be one and a half to two times the normal or the I don't take Coumadin range. The INR needs a little explanation. Uh, the INR was actually created because there was a variance in what we considered the normal PT. Um, if you were to go to England, we'll say, they were going by different PT levels than we were here. And the INR actually came about as a standardized universal number that we could look at and all be talking about the same left value. Some doctors still like their PTTs, and that's what they use to determine the treatment plan. Some doctors like their INRs to go by. Some doctors will use a combination of INR and PTT. I mean, INR and PT, I'm sorry. So when you see the INR, it's just another way of measuring the therapeutic levels of Coumadin. The normal, I'm not on Coumadin level, usually your INR is going to be less than two. For it to be in therapeutic range, two to three is generally considered therapeutic. Depending on why you're getting Coumadin, if patients have prosthetic valves, they might actually have an INR that's closer to uh, three and a half or maybe even four. So it depends. But what you need to know is you need to tie the INR to the PT and know those go hand in hand in monitoring Coumadin therapy. The antidote for Coumadin overdose is vitamin K. Um, something to keep in mind about Coumadin is it does take two days before Coumadin is actually therapeutic in the body. So we can't just give it to them and then instantly it's working. It could take up to two days before our blood levels or our PT levels will reach therapeutic levels. Also, we need to teach the patient to decrease their leafy greens in their diet. Leafy greens are very, very high in vitamin K. So a patient could actually be on Coumadin and go home and eat salads, and they would be giving themselves the antidote. No wonder their PT doesn't do anything, okay? And that does happen. That can happen. A third drug that we need to talk about is called Lovenox. Lovenox is a low molecular weight heparin. It's a derivative of the traditional heparin that we were talking about, but Lovenox is actually a lot safer. The risk for bleeding is a lot, lot less with this drug. Um, and we may use it for the prevention of DVT on patients that are immobile or in hospitalized patients that are bedridden. We see Levinox given frequently. And we may also use it for acute coronary syndrome as well or patients that are having a heart attack. Sub-Q is the route of choice. And the interesting thing about this is we do not have to monitor PTs or PTTs or anything with Levinox. There are no lab values to monitor. But what we do have to monitor for is bleeding because there still is a slight risk for bleeding as well. Under the other notable, notable information there, the LMWH stands for Low Molecular Weight Heparin. But again, decreased risk for bleeding when it when you get it out of the Pixis or wherever you get the medication, it does come in a pre-filled syringe with a little nitrogen bubble that's already in the syringe. And I think we've talked about this in pharmacology lab. You leave the bubble in the syringe. You do not get rid of that bubble. It'll be the last thing that goes into the patient and it helps lock the medication in place. So you leave the bubble there in the syringe with Levinox. Also, you do not massage or aspirate with Levinox administration. 
interesting thing. It's very different from heparin, but we can use the protamine sulfate again as the antidote if we do have a Lovenox um, overdose. All right, we're going to move on to some of the chronic venous insufficiency um, issues. This is a group of disorders resulting from faulty venous valves. And essentially what happens is we have a reduction in venous return. What I want you to understand with venous insufficiency is this accumulates, this takes years to develop. Signs and symptoms may include swollen limbs, thick brownish discolored skin and that's one of the classic classic symptoms you may see if y'all ever picked up a patient that had like edema in their lower extremities but then you notice a brownish discoloration of the skin that's a big hint there that this patient has some chronic venous insufficiency they'll get the brown discoloration in their legs they may develop venous stasis ulcerations they may have itchy scaly dry skin and the treatment for this is to elevate the legs, avoid prolonged standing or sitting or crossing of the legs. And these would be the folks that we would recommend the TED hose for, or those support hose. With venous stasis ulcerations, this is the end stage of chronic venous insufficiency. What has happened is this area that has decreased um, venous circulation and we don't have the ability to return the blood to the circulation. They can actually develop ulcers in those areas. High risk areas are the skin of the lower legs. And all of this is just due to the stasis of the blood. So where we see that brown and discoloration of the skin, that's the same place we're going to see those venous stasis ulcers occur. They usually appear with a irregular border and they may have a beefy red base to them. Okay, and they're very hard to treat and to get taken care of because you just have decreased circulation of that area. The treatment may include elevating the legs, good wound care, moist dressings that will be changing as the nurse, uh, the support hose or the TED hose, and sometimes debridement may actually be indicated to help facilitate that new granulation tissue. Moving on to the arterial disorders. With peripheral arterial occlusive disorders, this is where there's a narrowing or occlusion of the arterial lumen. The primary cause for peripheral arterial occlusive disorders is going to be your atherosclerosis or the plaque buildup inside the lumens of the vessel. There are some other issues listed there that can uh, contribute to peripheral arterial disorders. There are three specific types I just want you to say, yeah, I've heard of those and know a little bit about. And they include your intermittent claudication, res pain, and dependent ruber. With their intermittent claudication, this is when the patient has cramping or aching sensation in the calves of the legs. It may even come up to the buttocks or the thighs. And what this is due to is they have pain experienced while walking that's relieved by rest. What happens is you just have a decreased circulation to this area. And when we don't have oxygen-rich blood get into an area, it can cause the buildup of toxins and cause pain in the area. So it is reproducible pain. The patient knows when they go walk, especially if they're walking uphill, like an incline, that it's going to cause this uh, intermittent claudication or severe pain. <coughs> Rest pain is defined as dull, deep pain with numbness in the toes and the feet. And this is pretty self-explanatory. The pain will increase when the legs are elevated because we've decreased the circulation to the extremities. But when we have the feet hanging dependent, it actually increases the circulation so the pain is not as bad. And then dependent ruber, this is probably one of the more common ones that we see. This is where the skin is really pale or has a pallor appearance when the legs are elevated. But the longer the patient leaves the legs dangling, those legs get red and beefy, almost purple in appearance. Have y'all seen legs that look like that before? Well, that's called dependent ruber. Another disorder we need to talk about is Raynaud's syndrome or Raynaud's phenomenon. This is due to a vasospastic or obstructive intermittent 
conditions. So this is intermittent. It does come and go. What happens is the small arteries in response to a stimuli, which may be cold, nicotine, caffeine, stress, it could be various things in the environment, it causes the arteries to constrict. It cuts off blood flow to usually we think of the hands. It could also be the feet. It causes the hands to blanch or have pallor. I mean, they get really pale, followed by cyanosis, and then they get really purpley red or have rubber in color. Um, traditionally, we consider or we would think of um, renal phenomenon or renal syndrome happening with patients who have lupus or scleroderma, which is a term we use for hardening of the skin, or also with rheumatoid arthritis. So there is a autoimmune component to renal syndrome. But what we need to teach the patients, if they do have this, is they need to keep their extremities warm. They also need to stop smoking because smoking is going to cause more vasoconstriction on top of what they already have and decrease their circulation. Calcium channel blockers or angiotensin receptor blockers may be beneficial to help open up those vessels as well. Uh, there was a student several semesters ago, it was during the summer, she would always wear mittens to class because just being in the air conditioner would cause her to have um, an aggravation of her Raynaud syndrome. So it was just interesting to have a student in the middle of the summer who wore mittens to class. Another disorder I want you to have a little information about is called Berger's disease. Berger's disease is a recurring inflammatory vasculitis in the extremities. It starts distally, but what happens as this vasculitis reoccurs, it causes tissue necrosis. And over the time, the patient essentially starts losing um, tissue distally. They might start having necrotic fingers, and it's slowly going to progress <coughs> up the extremities towards the trunk. Uh, we tend to see this start in the legs, and this tends to start with, or we see it more commonly in young men who smoke heavily. The cause is truly unknown, but there is a correlation to smoking in males and Berger's disease. Um, I worked with a young man that had Berger's disease, and he continued to smoke and do all his extracurricular habits until he had no legs or arms to hold his cigarette to go smoke. But essentially what happened is over a period of time, his extremities just necrosed uh, distally to proximally, and he ended up having his arms and legs amputated. Signs and symptoms, obviously if something is ischemic, you're going to have pain, color changes, necrosis is going to occur, edema, pulses may go from a plus two pulse to a plus one pulse to I haven't got a pulse anymore. And then gangrene is also a complication, which of course we would have to amputate that extremity of gangrene set in. We need to teach the patients no smoking, avoid exposure to cold, because cold is going to cause vasoconstriction, and that's just going to make this, the um, condition worse. Also, pain control is very important. Calcium channel blockers, again, going to use those to help vasodilate those vessels. All right, any questions about the vascular disorders? <coughs> Y'all need a break or we're going to push on? How about a fast push to the end? Go. No. Go? Okay. Here we go. Oh, that was a go, go, go. Okay, we're going. Hematological disorders. Uh, anemia. We're going to talk about some different types of anemia real quick. Obviously, with anemia, the patient has a deficiency in the number of red blood cells, otherwise known as erythrocytes. When looking at a patient's hemoglobin and hematocrit, y'all had a little bit different values earlier. Again, go by whatever facility you're working at. Go by their norms. Um, but I've got some general ranges there for the female and for the male. Please note that the female's hemoglobin is traditionally going to be a little bit lower for the normal range. Okay. Same thing with the hematocrit. Something you need to keep in mind, though, is in most patients, you're going to have a 1 to 3 ratio hemoglobin to hematocrit. So if your hemoglobin is 8, which would be low, your hematocrit is going to be right around 24, okay, in most cases. Causes of anemia, maybe the patient's lost blood, maybe they're not making blood, or maybe the blood they've made is being destroyed. 
So we'll do lots of blood testing, which will include H and H, which stands for hemoglobin hematocrit. The doctor may order an MCV, an MCH, or an MCHC, which I didn't spell out on the slide, but essentially what those are is they are looking at the color, the size, the shape of red blood cells. And if we suspect the patient has chronic anemia, we're going to see abnormal MCVs, MCHs, and MCHCs because the shape, the color, and the size of the blood cell is going to be atypical. Also, the doctor might do a reticulocyte count. Those are immature red blood cells to see if the body's making more blood cells. And he may also test iron levels because the anemia could be related to an iron deficiency. TIBC is total iron binding capacity. Do we have the ability to do something with the iron that is in the body? If we don't know why the patient is losing blood or where they're losing blood, we might actually do a stool guaiac test, otherwise known as a hemocult test. We'll test the stool for blood. Patients may be losing blood in their stool and they're not aware that they do have blood loss. And then, of course, an endoscopy procedure may be indicated if we suspect the loss is through GI. With iron deficiency anemia, this is the most common type of anemia. We tend to tie this to the pregnant uh, females, elderly, and those that are malnourished. Essentially, they just need more iron. But it may be they're not taking in enough iron or um, they have malabsorption issues. The patient may be pale, have glossitis, and that's an inflammation of the tongue. We may pick up on low serum iron levels or low total iron binding capacity levels too when we look at their blood studies. The fix, you give them iron. Does anybody know what you give with iron to increase the absorption? Vitamin D. Orange juice, vitamin C. Given vitamin C with iron will help increase the absorption of iron. We also have to consider constipation, though, too. If we're giving the patient iron, one of the complications could be constipation. I'll tell you a little bit about it there. The routes of iron may be pills. We might give iron shots. If we do give iron shots, those need to be given with a Z track. Those need to be deep. Side effects, it can cause some GI upset, constipation I've already mentioned. If the child is having to take iron, it will stain the teeth. The liquid form of iron will stain the teeth, so we give it through a straw to bypass the teeth. Patients need to avoid antacids and antibiotics. Those can interfere with iron absorption. Uh, I've already mentioned taking it with the vitamin C, and we may actually have to take it past the time that our blood returns to a normal level. With aplastic anemia, the patient is deficient in red blood cell production. We just don't have enough red blood cells. The most common reason for aplastic anemia is usually acquired, meaning maybe the patient has chemotherapy and we have a de we've suppressed the bone marrow, so we have a deficient production of red blood cells. Signs and symptoms may include pancytopenia. That's a big old word, but it's not a word to be scared of. If you think of panoramic, that means across the board, right? Panoramic view. Psi is cell. Penia means in the blood. So pancytopenia is decreased levels of all the blood. Your white blood cells are going to be decreased. Your red blood cells are going to be decreased, and so are your platelets. Pancytopenia. Fatigue and dyspnea may also occur. And you can have complications. If you don't have white blood cells, well, then you're going to be at risk for infection. And if you don't have platelets, you're going to be at risk for hemorrhage. The treatment for these folks would be to give them erythropoietin, which is a bone marrow stimulant. This increases the production of uh, the blood components in the bone marrow, red blood cells especially. Bone marrow transplants may be indicated or immunosuppressants may be indicated, but the number one reason for aplastic anemia, it's acquired. It's something we have done to the body. You can tie it to chemo if you want to think of, because chemo is, it will cause um, aplastic anemia. Another type of anemia is pernicious anemia. The patient will have a lack of intrinsic factor. Intrinsic factor binds with dietary vitamin B12, so it can be absorbed. 
Okay, and folks that have malabsorption disorders or vegetarians are going to be at risk for having pernicious anemia. They, too, will exhibit some pallor. Uh, they may have a smooth, beefy red tongue. There's the tongue again, the tongue being inflamed or the tongue being beefy red. So any tongue issues, you might be able to tie to anemia. Uh, the patient may also have fatigue or paresthesias. What do they need? They need vitamin B12. So we can either increase their intake of B12 or we could give sub-Q injections once a month. And a lot of times that's what patients do. If they have malabsorption issues, we have to give B12 sub-Q. Polycythemia vera is where the patient has increased production of red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. Everything is being overproduced to the point where the blood is very viscous or very thick. The blood gets very thick, well, then it makes it um, hard for the heart to pump one, but it causes congestion of all the tissues in the organs. We look at this patient's hemoglobin level. The levels may be 18 to 25. So they're going to have super, super, super high hemoglobin levels. The treatment for somebody with polycythemia vera would be phlebotomy, where we actually go in and we draw off some of the blood to make their blood not so thick. And it might be anywhere from 500 to 2,000 milliliters of blood at a time. We also can give them myelosuppressive agents, and that's just a big fancy term for things that are going to slow down the bone marrow production of the white blood cells, red blood cells, and platelets. So we'll slow down the blood production of blood, basically. Hemophilia is another blood disorder, just want to mention briefly. There are two types. Well, there are more than these two types, but these are the two most common types, type A and type B. Type A is the most common. It's also called classic hemophilia. The patient is lacking factor 8, clotting factor 8, or intrinsic factor 8. The gene is carried by the mom, and hemophilia will be seen in the son. Okay, so hemophiliacs are usually the boys, and the gene is carried by the mom. Same thing with hemophilia B. It's also called Christmas disease, no relation to the holiday. Um, but these patients have a lack of intrinsic factor 9. Again, carried by the mom. See the gene in the mom, but then we'll actually see the hemophilia in the boy. Problems with hemophilia, regardless, is prolonged bleeding, obviously, which could lead to shock or death. They have recurrent hematomas, hemothrosis, and that's accumulation of blood in the joint space, which can be very painful. Hematuria, or blood in the urine, and obviously pain as well. We may have to transfuse factor 8 or 9 until the bleeding is under control. Um, we may have to give whole blood transfusions if they've had massive blood loss. Ice packs and joint immobilization may be beneficial, especially if they're bleeding into the joints. And then range of motion will be utilized after the bleeding has stopped. PO analgesics will be used, but you do not want to use anything that's going to increase bleeding, like aspirin. That would be a bad idea. And even NSAIDs. We kind of stay, stay away from NSAIDs as well because they can increase bleeding as well. Corticosteroids may also be used to decrease inflammation. But definitely want to teach the patient about bleeding precautions. Contact sports are going to be out of the question. Absolutely out of the question. Please notice I put with the pain medicines too, we're going to give PO medications instead of IV or IM medicines because the patient's going to be at higher risk for bleeding. Sickle cell disease is a group of inherited disorders where we have an abnormal form of hemoglobin that causes the red blood cells to stiffen and elongate. I think of them as being little stiff boomerangs traveling in the circulatory system. Usually you think of little red blood cells as being round, but their, their uh, blood cells actually change shape and they get this odd boomerang-like appearance and it makes it difficult for them to pass through the vessels. It makes it very painful too. This occurs due to hypoxia or decreased O2 levels. And I've got the different risk groups there that we see that have sickle cell disease. Uh, most commonly that we're familiar with would be the African-American populations. Um, they, this is an incurable disease. There's no cure for it. And usually it's fatal by middle age because they will have organ failure due to sickle cell. 
there is a difference between having the disease and having the trait. Having the trait means you don't have the disease, but if you have a child with somebody who has the disease, their chances of developing the disease would actually be um, increased. So if you have the trait, it's the recessive gene. But if you had two people that have the trait, you actually could have somebody that ended up with sickle cell disease itself. So it is possible. I remember working in the ER having someone who was who had the trait who would mimic sickle cell crisis to come in and get pain medications and things like that. So there is a difference between the disease and the trait. With a sickle cell crisis, the patient will have periodic episodes of extensive sickling, again, the changing of the shape of the red blood cells. This will lead to infarctions or decreased circulation to tissue, which then can lead to organ failure. And we tend to think of renal or your kidneys and the lungs being the hardest hit. It is a very painful condition, um, and most of that is due to the decreased oxygen getting to the tissues. Swelling, pallor, fatigue may also occur, but most sickle cell crises are started by either hypoxia or decreased O2. If the patient gets dehydrated, they can get into a crisis. If there's an infection, vascular stasis, or if their body temperature gets low enough or they have vasoconstriction, that could put them into a crisis as well. This slide just goes over some of the clinical manifestations, looking at the different body parts involved with sickle cell. The treatment on our part will be O2. We want to get their O2 sats as much as possible. This will help control the sickling or the changing of the shape of the blood cells. Also, pain management. We like to use morphine with these patients because they're going to be getting ongoing drugs. And if we give them too much Demerol, it can cause seizure activity. Okay, so morphine is the drug of choice for sickle cell patients. <coughs> also, we were going to hydrate them aggressively. They're going to get lots of isotonic fluids. And you all know the isotonic fluids stay in the vessel, so that's going to help our sickling cells in there, um, help keep them mobile. Blood transfusions may be indicated if the hemoglobin is low enough, if there's infection present, antibiotics, and the patient may also be on anticoagulants if there's a risk for clotting. So we're going to hydrate them. It might be up to three liters per day. That's pretty aggressive. They need to avoid high altitudes, okay, which would cause hypoxia, which could cause a sickle crisis. Avoid tight, constricting clothing. If you, they wear tight, constricted clothing, that's going to decrease their circulation too. Folic acid will help build healthy red blood cells. And the hydroxyurea, otherwise known as hydrea, they may be on as well. This decreases the sickling and also prolongs red blood cell life. So they might be on a combination of folic acid and hydrea to promote healthy red blood cells. Genetic testing will also be needed if the patient with sickle cell is considering having children. And finally, we'll talk about thalassemia. Thalassemia is a genetic disorder where a patient has inadequate production of normal hemoglobin. We don't see this really anywhere close to here. We see this more so near the Mediterranean Sea or near the equator. Um, but there are two different types of thalassemia. There could be thalassemia major, which we could have a patient that has a life-threatening condition. Uh, we may also see delayed physical and mental growth in these patients. Or they could have thalassemia minor. And when a patient has thalassemia, it'll say whether it's thalassemia major or thalassemia minor. With thalassemia minor, they're generally going to be asymptomatic or just have mild anemia. So there are two extremes uh, with thalassemias. There is no specific drug or diet that's effective in treating thalassemia. The treatment is going to just be symptomatic. Are there any questions about the cardiovascular lecture? Are y'all awake? Yes. Yes. You're alive. Are <laughs>